Hello, everyone. Lance here, getting ready to bring you a Bible study for our Wednesday night uh, video stream on our Facebook channel and YouTube channel. I uh, invite you to open your Bible with me to Genesis 31. Uh, Genesis chapter 31 is what we'll be looking at. If you remember last time when we looked at Genesis 30, uh, we saw that Jacob made an agreement with Laban uh, on how he would deal with the flocks and herds. And from that, he would take part of that. Um, and then Laban would receive the rest. And ultimately, uh, God blesses Jacob and Jacob has um, a great uh, number of flocks. His livestock increased. He was very prosperous. And when we get to chapter 31, things are going to change just a little bit because Jacob is going to get ready to uh, return back to the land of Canaan, back to his homeland. I want to begin by reading the first 21 verses, and we'll, we'll start there with looking at the first 21 verses of Genesis 31. Now, Jacob heard the words of Laban's sons, saying, Jacob has taken away all that was our father's, and from what was our father's he has acquired all his, this wealth. And Jacob saw the countenance of Laban, and indeed it was not favorable toward him as before. Then the Lord said to Jacob, Return to the land of your father's, <clears throat> excuse me, and to your family, and I will be with you. So Jacob sent <clears throat> and called Rachel and Leah to the field to his flock. And he said to them, I see your father's countenance, that he is not favorable toward me as before, but the God of my father has been with me. And you know that with all my might I have served your father, yet your father has deceived me and changed my wages ten times. But God did not allow him to hurt me. If he said, had said thus, the if he said thus, <clears throat> the sprinkled shall be your wages, then all the flocks bore speckled. And if he had said thus, the streak shall be your wages, then all the flocks bore streak. So God has taken away the livestock of your father and given them to me. And it happened at the time when the flocks conceived that I lifted my eyes and saw in a dream. And behold, the rams which leaped upon the flocks were streaked, speckled, and gray spotted. Then the angel of God spoke to me in a dream, saying, Jacob, and I said, here I am. And he said, lift your eyes and now see all the rams which leap on the flocks are streaked, speckled and gray spotted. For I've seen all that Laban has, is doing to you. I am the God of Bethel where you anointed the pillar and where you made a vow to me. Now arise, get out of this land and return to the land of your family. Then Rachel and Leah answered and said to him, is there still any portion or inheritance for us in our father's house? Are we not considered strangers by him? For he has sold us and also completely consumed our money. For all these riches which God has taken from our father are really ours and our children's. Now then, whatever God has said to you, do it. Then Jacob rose and set his sons and his wives on camels and carried away all his livestock and all his possessions which, which he had gained, his acquired livestock which he had gained in Padan Aram to go to his father Isaac in the land of Canaan. Now Laban had gone to shear his sheep and Rachel had stolen the household idols that were her father's. And Jacob stole away, unknown to Laban, the Syrian, in that he did not tell him that he intended to flee. So he fled with all that he had. He arose and crossed the river and headed toward the mountains of Gilead. That's the first 21 verses of Genesis 31. There are a number of things that play out here in these beginning verses of this chapter. One is that Jacob is hearing Laban's sons talk about him in a negative way, that he has stolen and taken all of Laban's good and goods and therefore their uh, goods and livestock, and he's built this great wealth by taking all of those things. And so he knows that things are unfavorable toward him from the family standpoint, uh, both from the sons of Laban and from Laban himself. And so he's ready to move on. He's ready, and it seems to be in Jacob's mind that the time is right for him to uh, get out of this place. But not only that, he also recognizes that God has blessed him during this time, that what he has received has been because God has blessed him. He also recognizes that the flocks were specifically blessed uh, to bring the offspring that would benefit uh, him, benefit Jacob, because of God. And then he is uh, letting us in on this revelation that came from God and from the angel of God, uh, speaking to him in a dream, confirming that, yes, indeed, all of this happened because God has blessed you. And so he calls Rachel and Leah to himself, and he tells them about all of this and tells them that it's time for them to go and leave and go back uh, to his homeland. And not only that 
it's his decision, but that in that revelation from the angel of God, God speaks to him and tells him in verse 13 there of Genesis 31, now arise, get out of this land and return to the land of your family. And so God is saying it's time for you to go to the land of your family. And Rachel and Leah, as they respond to Jacob, it's kind of interesting. They uh, raise the question, but it's it's kind of a rhetorical question, uh, like what's left for us in our father's house? They recognize that they've been given to Jacob as wives. Uh, and it seems that when Laban separated himself from Jacob, at least at that point in time, uh, Rachel and Leah were also separated. And so basically they said there's no more inheritance. There's no more reason for us to stay. Um, he says in verse 15, they say in verse 15, that they are like strangers to Laban. He sold them and he's completely consumed their money. So there's nothing for him to wait for. And so they say, ultimately, at the end of verse 16, whatever God has said to you, do it. So they're on board. So Jacob gets everything together for them to be able to leave and to go on out of this place and to go back toward his homeland. And He's doing this unannounced. He's doing this without letting Laban know ahead of time. And so the text will say in verse 20 that he stole away. That's not a phrase that we typically use, but the real meaning of it is that he he leaves unannounced. He leaves um, secretly, if you will, or without any kind of forewarning. And that's the statement even made there that he stole away unknown to Laban. Laban did not know that he was intending to flee and go back to his homeland and be gone for good. But Jacob gets his things ready, gets his possessions together, and he's ready to go back and head to the land of Canaan, back to his father Isaac. And Laban has gone out to shear his sheep, and so he's nowhere nearby. And we also read in this text a very key thing that's going to come up in the rest of the chapter, and that is that Rachel uh, steals the household items that were her father's. And so it's kind of a weird twist in the story that this is going to take place where these items are stolen, these idols are stolen away. And so this is going to be a secret flight out from the land uh, of Laban and back to the land of Canaan um, by Jacob and his family. Well, let's read the next section because the next section is going to get into uh, maybe some other interesting points as well as lessons that we might can learn from this text. So let's read Um, let's read through verse 35 and I'll make a few comments there. Genesis 31, beginning in verse 22. And Laban was told on the third day that Jacob had fled. Then he took his brethren with him and pursued him for seven days journey. And he overtook him in the mountains of Gilead. But God had come to Laban, the Syrian in a dream by night and said to him, be careful that you speak to Jacob, neither good nor bad. So Laban overtook Jacob Now Jacob had pitched his tent in the mountains, and Laban with his brethren pitched in the mountains of Gilead. And Laban said to Jacob, what have you done? That you have stolen away unknown to me and carried away my daughters like captives taken with the sword. Why did you flee away secretly and steal away from me and not tell me? For I might have sent you away with joy and songs, with timbrel and harp. And you did not allow me to kiss my sons and my daughters. Now you have done foolishly in so doing. It is in my power to do to do you harm. But the God of your father spoke to me last night, saying, be careful that you speak to Jacob, neither good nor bad. And now you have surely gone because you greatly long for your father's house. But why did you steal my gods? Then Jacob answered and said to Laban, because I was afraid for I said, perhaps you would take your daughters from me by force with whomever you find your gods. Do not let them live. In the presence of your brethren, identify what I have of yours and take it with you. For Jacob did not know that Rachel had stolen them. And Laban went into Jacob's tent, into Leah's tent, and into the two maids' tents, but he did not find them. Then he went out of Leah's tent and entered Rachel's tent. Now Rachel had taken the household idols, put them in a camel's saddle, and sat on them. And Laban searched all about the tent, but did not find them. And she said to her father, let it not displease my Lord that I cannot rise before you for the manner of women is with me. And he searched, but he did not find the household idols. So here, Jacob and all of his family and possessions leave. 
<clears throat> on the third day, Laban is made aware of this, and he is going to go and try to catch up with him, and he does. He catches up with him in the mountains of Gilead. He's warned by God not to speak good or evil to him, so kind of like you know, a do no harm kind of thing. And Laban ultimately really just questions Jacob about why did he leave unannounced, and then he presses on him, why did you steal my gods, my idols? Jacob has no knowledge of this, it would seem, at the time, and so uh, he tells him, wherever you find your gods, don't even let that person live. A very strong statement about <clears throat> how serious that Jacob was that he didn't believe that any of his family had stolen anything from Laban. And uh, as Laban goes through the tents, he doesn't find anything. We know that it's with Rachel. If Jacob had known it was with Rachel, he certainly wouldn't have made the promise that he did. And Rachel sits on them um, as they're in a camel bag and tells her father she can't get up because the manner of women is with her. And so uses that as an excuse to not have to rise up and reveal what uh, could be seen there with the idols being in that saddlebag. Now, you know, to this point in time, we kind of are still, <clears throat> you know, wondering, well, what? You know, what in the world uh, is going on here? Um, you know, with these household gods that were talked about, the idols, <clears throat> that was certainly something of that time that had a special value and had special meaning. And it would appear that Rachel was maybe trying to take a jab at her father, uh, maybe trying to remove that from his temptation. You know, if there's any kind of different thing that maybe we could surmise as a possible thing. Um, Meryl Unger explains that Rachel's theft of her father's gods um, could have been uh, understood in the light of the new zoo evidence, N-U-Z-U. Evidently, the possession of these household gods implied leadership of the family, and in the case of a married daughter, assured her husband the right of the property of her father. And so maybe this was kind of a... a uh, a point being made by Rachel that in her eyes, uh, Jacob um, rightfully owned all the possessions that he had taken, inherited, earned while working for Laban, serving for Laban, and being there in his uh, household. We're not really told in the text what the real reason is. There's a number of different uh, statements and different commentaries. Just wanted to provide that one in this instance that you could think about that maybe she was just trying to uh, kind of put an exclamation point on her belief that her husband uh, deserved and was the rightful possessor of all the things that he had uh, that had come while uh, working for Laban. Well, let's see what happens next. Beginning in verse 36 down through verse 42. Then Jacob was angry and rebuked Laban. And Jacob answered and said to Laban, what is my trespass? What is my sin that you have so hotly pursued me? Although you have searched all my things, what part of your household things have you found? Set it here before my brethren and your brethren that they may judge between us both. These 20 years I have been with you, your ewes, your female goats have not miscarried their young, and I have not eaten the rams of your flock. That which was torn by beast I did not bring to you. I bore the loss of it. You require it from my hand, whether stolen by day or stolen by night. There I was in the day the drought consumed me and the frost by night and my sleep departed from my eyes. Thus, I have been in your house 20 years. I served you 14 years for your two daughters and six years for your flock. And you have changed my wages 10 times. Unless the God of my father, the God of Abraham and the fear of Isaac, had been with me, surely now you would have sent me away empty-handed. God has seen my affliction and the labor of my hands and rebuked you last night. So here's Jacob's response to all this. He is um, infuriated. He's mad. He's frustrated that Laban has made these accusations that he stole something, that he's even upset that he has left because he has served him for these 20 years Laban has repeatedly changed his wages, he says, 10 times in all of this. And uh, if it was up to Laban, he's basically saying, I would have left empty handed. But because of God, I have left with possessions. 
Well, Laban is going to have a response to this. Beginning in verse 43, let's read this through the end of the chapter. Verse 43, and Laban answered and said to Jacob, these daughters are my daughters, and these children are my children, and this flock is my flock. All that you see is mine, but what can I do this day to these my daughters or to their children whom they have born? Now, therefore, come, let us make a covenant, you and I, and let it be a witness between you and me. So Jacob took a stone and set it up as a pillar. Then Jacob said to his brethren, gather stones, and they took stones and made a heap, and they ate there on the heap. Laban called it Jagar Sahudatha, but Jacob called it Galid. And Laban said, this heap is a witness between you and me this day. Therefore, his name was called Galid. Also Mizpah, because he said, may the Lord watch between you and me when we're absent from one another. If you afflict my daughters or if you take other wives besides my daughters, although no man is with us, see God is witness between you and me. Then Laban said to Jacob, here is this heap, and here is this pillar, which I have placed between you and me. This heap is a witness, and this pillar is a witness, that I will not pass beyond this heap to you, and you will not pass beyond this heap and this pillar to me for harm. The God of Abraham, the God of Nahor, the God of their father, judge between us. And Jacob swore by the fear of his father Isaac. Then Jacob offered a sacrifice on the mountain and called his brethren to eat bread, and they ate bread and stayed all night on the mountain. And early in the morning, Laban arose and kissed his sons and daughters and blessed them. Then Laban departed and returned to his place. And so here's a covenant that's ultimately made between Laban and Jacob. They build up a pillar of stones, a heap of stones, and they name that place. They eat on that place and they say their peace to one another in this place. And ultimately, it's a witness uh, to be a witness uh, between the two, uh, that they would uh, ultimately not uh, come past that point toward one another with the intent of harm, uh, that they would, this would be a, a peaceful covenant, a peaceful relationship between them at this point. So Laban and Jacob have really an interesting uh, relationship and situation, don't they? A son and a father-in-law, a man that required this young man, Jacob, to work for him for 14 years to marry his daughters, required him to work for him for seven years to marry the daughter that he loved only to pull a switcheroo and fool him or trick him into marrying the oldest daughter first, and then requiring him to work another seven years for the daughter that he loved, Rachel, the younger Although he did go ahead and give Rachel to him in a week's time, uh, he did require him to work that out. And then he twisted his arm into working for him another six years. And in that six years, Jacob was able to build his wealth because God blessed him with how he kept the flocks and the way that all of that uh, surpassed uh, any reasonable expectations. It truly had to have been a blessing from God. And so they make this covenant together. And that's going to be interesting uh, as far as how they see one another from that point forward. You'll notice throughout the Old Testament text that there are a number of times in which covenants like this are made, uh, agreements like this are made, a testimony is given between each side, and an agreement is made. And these places uh, become uh, places of significance, and, and they're memorialized. And even in our day and time, as we drive down the road, we may see a uh, historical marker on the side of the road that denotes where some historical event took place, maybe a, a battle in a war or uh, some other uh, noteworthy time in history. Uh, somebody of note lived or passed away, uh, whatever it may be. And so we kind of still recognize the, the reality of those monuments, if you will. Uh, our, our national capital, Washington, D.C., is filled with uh, monument after monument that has been uh, put in place and established in such a way as to call to remembrance certain people and events in our nation's history. And certainly these kind of things were the case here, but they were between families, uh, between Laban and his uh, family, his flocks, herds, and uh, servants, and then ultimately now between Jacob and his family and his flocks and his herds and servants and it was going to be a line of demarcation between the two that they would not come toward one another past this point uh, with the intent of harm. Well, 
more than anything, we're just learning some of the history of the family of Jacob. This is how we get to the nation of Israel with all these children born to Jacob, his two wives, and then the two handmaids that also become wives as well. I hope this has been helpful for us to look at this for just a few moments. Uh, I do want to leave you maybe with just an encouraging thought. You know, what God blesses is what really matters, isn't it? Laban was the one that began with all the possessions and all the power, if you will. Jacob came to Laban with nothing. But then Jacob is going to leave Laban with great possessions, so much so that it would seem that the sons of Laban are under this idea that, you know, there's really nothing nothing left on Laban's side of the scale. It was smaller. He grew it. But we can see in this story that it's not because of just what Jacob did. Now, truly, it appears that Jacob was a hard worker. He even he, he talked about that, that he was there in, in verse 40 of chapter 31. He was there in the day during the drought. He was there in the frost by night. His sleep departed from his eyes. Now, he worked hard during this time. But he also recognized that God blessed him, that it was because God blessed him that he had those things. At the end of verse 42, he says, God has seen my affliction and the labor of my hands and rebuked you last night. It's God. It's God that was with him. At the very beginning of verse 42, he says, unless the God of my father, the God of Abraham had been with me, you know, surely you would have sent me away empty handed. So here's the thought that I want to leave you with. Wouldn't we all be empty handed if it were not for God? God is the source of all of our good and blessings, all of our possessions. He is the reason that we're even brought into this life. What a blessing. Some unfortunate news has been known in our community here lately of some uh, small children, some babies that seemingly taken away from this physical life far too soon and far too early. And to me, that's been a very immediate reminder of what a blessing life itself is. What a blessing it is to look at our children and be able to see them as they grow, knowing that it's God that provides that life and that hope and the sustenance that we're able to provide as parents to them and as those who care for them. We are doing all of that ultimately because of the eternal, godly, providential giving of our Heavenly Father above because of His power, His wisdom, His strength, and the possessions that we have. We're really simply servants taking care of them because it all belongs to Him. Will you pray with me? Our Father in heaven, we humbly bow before you. And first and foremost, Father, thankful for every blessing that you give us, life itself. So thankful, recognizing that you, you are the provider of all things, the creator, the sustainer, the one that in your wisdom has made us what we are, given us every good and perfect gift to which we can enjoy life, which we can sustain life, which we can work with our hands and our mind to serve others and to be able to help ourselves. And Father, we just so much want to thank you for all of those blessings. And Father, we also thank you that we have the scriptures that we can turn to, to learn the history of your people, to learn the history of your plan of redemption, a plan of salvation for all of mankind, how that you used people just like us, people who struggled, people who failed at times, uh, people who had imperfections, to accomplish what you needed to accomplish, what you desired to accomplish. And all of it ultimately was done to benefit us, that we might have hope, that we might have salvation, that we might be forgiven, that we might come to know you, love you, and serve you. 
Father, we beg for your mercy where we fail. We often do. And we pray for your strength and your guidance and your comfort that we can get up and try again and do better to serve you each day. And we look forward to the hope of heaven with you someday. We're so thankful for Jesus, for his love and his sacrifice. And it's in his name that we humbly pray. Amen.